the coordinators and presenters of today's session. Uh, first up is Nanette Warburton. Nanette Warburton is our product develop manager, which means she looks for new products for SAFMED and has the ability to assist you if you're struggling to find something. She's also our surgical product manager. That's her area of expertise. Her previous experience includes that of procurement of capital equipment for a private healthcare group and that of a theatre unit manager. Myself, Sana Jardine, I'm head of education for SAFMED. I'm also the chairperson of the CCD forums of South Africa. I have a master's in nursing science with my speciality area being decontamination sciences. Prior to joining SAFMED as an educator, I had experience as a theatre unit manager, having worked both locally and overseas. SAFMED, as you may or may not know, has launched this series of webinars. This is um, webinar number four. We are dealing with managing instruments and devices contaminated by pathogenic microorganisms like CREs, like COVID, for example. And today we are covering cleaning, part two of cleaning, and that where we're referring to uh, cleaning using an automated washer disinfector. What will we cover in today's session? These are the main points that we're planning to cover. We're going to understand why it is we need an automated washer disinfector and why it is we should be cleaning every device that can possibly be cleaned in an automated washer disinfector in a washer disinfector. We'll go into more detail uh, around the SAND standard. The standard governs how um, automated washer disinfectors need to function, how they need to be manufactured, what systems they need to have in place, and that standard is uh, 15883. Then from a practical perspective, we'll look at how to load and how to unload an automated washer disinfector. We'll focus on the care and management and maintenance of your automated washer disinfector. And lastly, we'll, we'll talk about the difference between validation and verification of cleaning efficacies. We opened with this slide in our previous um, session on cleaning, and this uh, paper by, by Alpha was published already in 2010. And in this paper, Alpha explains that it is uh, the optimal, me optimal method of cleaning is to clean a um, uh, devices in an automated washer disinfector. Why? Because it's more thorough and it's more reproducible compared with manual cleaning. We do know that some devices will need to be cleaned manually. Just going to mute our participants. One second, apologies. Right, that's everybody muted then. Um, as I was saying in this paper that uh, Alpha published in 2010, the focus was on understanding why automated washer disinfectors are so important, um, although we do know some devices do need to be cleaned manually. We also all know that in order to make an instrument safe to be used on a patient, to render it in a manner that is safe to use on a patient, that device or instrument needs to go through a whole series of steps. And those steps, of course, include cleaning, disinfection, inspection, packaging, sterilization, safe transport, use and safe transport, again, of a contaminated device. And the entire process begins at the very beginning around cleaning. We covered this in great detail last week, the importance of wearing the correct PPE, the correct level of PPE, the correct type of PPE, and the importance of how to put it on and take it off properly, how to don and doff PPE. When you remove your PPE, doffing of PPE, we are at great risk of contaminating ourselves, especially when it comes to managing devices contaminated with COVID-19. Some may say, but I'm just loading, I'm just, I'm only loading the washer. Why do I need my PPE? Please don't be silly. Even loading the PPE, you do require that you wear the correct level of PPE. Do not skip PPE. 
As you can see over here, there are some nice courses. Uh, Dr. Mark Mendelssohn has got a lovely video. If you Google Mark Mendelssohn, you'll find it. It's a, a nice descriptive, easy to follow video. There's also a course on the World Health Organization website that you can do. It's for free, it takes 15 minutes, and it teaches you how to don and doff your PPE. When it comes to cleaning, there are four important things that need to happen. There's an interrelationship between these four factors, and those four factors will produce effective cleaning if you have them all in the right balance. We require chemical action, which means we need a detergent or a soap that's going to have effect on the by burden that we're trying to clean. We need some form of mechanical action, mechanical action being the rubbing and the scrubbing that is required. Then the time, the contact time that a device has with the detergent water combination and the temperature. The temperature at which the, the water comes in and the detergent mixes is very important. If you have the wrong temperature, it can have a disastrous effect on the cleaning efficacy and the cleaning outcomes. When you're cleaning manually, the um, mechanical action comes from the rubbing and the scrubbing that you use the brush or the cloth or whatever it is you're actually using to, to clean with. In an automated washer disinfector, that, that uh, mechanical action comes from the water, the pressure, the force of the water. If you look at the images on the slide, you'll see different images displaying force of water inside a washer's chamber. That's an incredible uh, force of water. That's often referred to as impingement or the impingement value, the force of the water on, on the particular device in this case. So we need to make sure that we have all of these elements are in place as described in Sinner's Circle. Depending on the setup of your machine will depend on how uh, these variables are arranged. You may have some chemistries that work at slightly higher temperatures. You may have chemistries that need a slightly lower temperature. You might need a stronger water force. You might need a, uh, a less um, strength in your water force. You might need greater contact time. All of that is dependent on the setup of that actual device which is why it's very important that once you've installed the device and it's been validated and verified and it's off and it's good to go, that you follow the instructions. You can't just change detergents. You can't just uh, change the cycle times and try to do stuff like that because you really and truly will affect the efficacy of that cleaning. This article was published in uh, 2014 in the Journal of Hospital Infection. And it was a review of reported outbreaks and incidents associated with inappropriate or ina inadequate or unsuccessful decontamination of surgical instruments. This was quite some time ago already, so there's been a whole bunch of stuff since then, of course. But this is just one of the articles that, that uh, talks about the, the difficulties of cleaning. There were 21 ad, um, articles identified at the time, and they dealt with failures in cleaning, disinfection, sterilizing, and rinsing. All of these factors play a huge role in good cleaning efficacies. Why a washer disinfector or an automated washer disinfector? Depending on whose journals you're reading or which guidelines you'll read, there'll be a reference to a washer disinfector. There'll be reference to an automated washer disinfector. Terminology changes a little bit. Let's look at a typical cycle of the washer disinfector. So we'll take all of our dirty instruments, we'll load them into the washer, and we'll cover that a little bit later in detail, and we hit the start button. Now, the cycle will depend on which, which, um, which program you choose, of course, but generally speaking, um, most programs are going to start with the pre-rinse. And that pre-rinse, generally, there's no detergent, and as you can see over there, the temperature is a little bit lower. Purposefully, if you look at the bar on the side, that tells you the temperature, the bar on the bottom looking at the time. We start with the pre-rinse. If your water temperature is too high at this point, you're going to cook on the proteins. If you've ever tried cooking an egg in a microwave, for example, and you haven't put enough butter in it, it cooks to the side walls of the cup that you're using or the bowl that you're using, because that's what proteins do. So the first pre-rinse, which is without detergent, is just rinsing off the gross debris and the gross soils, is at quite a low temperature. 
then during the wash phase, the temperature will increase, the incoming water temperature will increase because it is dependent, that temperature is dependent on the type of detergent that you're using. That relationship is very important and it'll be the, um, the temperature is adjusted depending on that detergent. Then we have a wash phase. After the wash, wash phase, it depends again on the setup. If you're using alkaline-based detergents, you may have to neutralize them. Some you do need to, some you don't need to, depending on the scenario. Then the instruments are rinsed. Then there's a disinfection phase. And that phase, if you look at the temperature over there on this particular chart, they were referring to a temperature of 93 degrees. And that we'll talk about a little bit later, that's called the AO relationship. It's uh, the temperature at which disinfection takes place, and that's a variable. It can be um, at, at a higher temperature for a shorter period of time or a slightly lower temperature for a longer period of time. And the very last phase of your wash cycle, of the uh, cycle in an automated washer disinfector is the drying cycle. You cannot get your instruments by hand when cleaning manually up to 93, 99 degrees. Uh, firstly, the water, you won't maintain that temperature in a big wide basin, and obviously you can't put your hands in boiling water. And of course, you don't have the value added benefit of drying. So that's what a typical cycle looks like. There are shorter cycles. You may have a, a machine that gives you a cycle that's just a disinfection rinse or you can select a cycle that um, doesn't do a pre-rinse, but just goes straight into a cleaning, depending, of course, on your needs and what the, the items look like. This is another interesting paper. It looked at um, uh, removing um, of, of biofilms and whether cleaning manually or whether cleaning in an automated fashion was more effective when it comes to removing biofilms. It also looked at how biofilms are formed, are formed over a period of time if you leave them on an instrument. So a variety of instruments using uh, crowl forceps, uh, use, um, an inoculation of those forceps. So they took a known amount of microorganisms and inoculated a crowl's forceps, which is similar to an artery, as you know, around the ratchet, around the shank, around the jaws with a known amount, as you can see, of microorganisms. They left those to stand for a period of time and then looked at it. And as you saw, after one hour, there was growth. After 12 hours, there was even more growth. So these um, microbes, which we measure in colony forming units, grow over time. So that makes us understand that the longer we leave our instruments lying there dirty, the more um, microorganisms there are on them to get off them. Then the Kraus forceps went, underwent two different types of cleaning methods, manual and automated cleaning. And without a doubt, the results showed that the, the bacterial load was decreased, the decrease was far better when being cleaned in an automated cleaning method. An important conclusion out of the study was automatic cleaning was more effective than manual cleaning but neither removed biofilms completely in this particular scenario. So that's quite important. And it does tell us over there that the pre-cleaning condition, as well as the forceps designs, can be a critical um, factor in, in processing quality. So the, device, the design of the device will determine how hard or how difficult it is to clean. And therefore, we always have to follow the manufacturer's instructions for use for that particular device. Certain devices, our instruments, often on our instruments on the IFUs, it'll stipulate that that device has to undergo ultrasonic cleaning first. So um, some devices will benefit from a lumen flush and the devices should be attached to some form of bloom and flush, which can be done in your automated washer disinfector, depending on what rack you're using and how the items loaded into the washer. They're all very, very relevant factors. The longer we leave our, our instruments lying around, especially if they're not pre-treated, the more growth that there is going to be of microorganisms, the harder it is going to be to clean them. And for sure, based on this published paper, we can see that automatic cleaning has a better result at the end of the day of, on the microbial load than manual cleaning does. Another paper from Central Sterilization Journal, looking at reprocessing of medical devices in exceptional 
situations, for example, COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic in this case. In this article, they also discussed the odd things that we are being asked to reprocess in the CSSD that we haven't been asked to reprocess in the past. It includes things like um, um, anesthetic equipment that are single use. It includes things like gowns that may be single use. It may be masks that we're reprocessing and have been required to reprocess under these very difficult conditions. Remember, nobody will advocate for the reuse of a single use device ever. We do, however, know that there have been some guidelines published as to how to reprocess some of these items that we really don't want to do, but may need to do under pandemic conditions. And uh, the, the statement out of this, that which I wanted to allude to the most, is hot water is the best disinfectant available in the hospital in this regard and protects the CCC employees during packing. And this works around, uh, we spoke a little bit earlier about the AO value, the disinfection. And that is absolutely important when it comes to, um, to washing our instruments and protecting us. Here's the definition of the AO value. So for a moist heat disinfection process, a particular time at a particular temperature can be expected to have a predictable lethal effect. So in a washer disinfector, um, we, we, we refer to the term an AO of more than 600, which means we need the disinfection to be at a higher level. At a bedpan washer, so this is defined, by the way, in the ISO standard, ISO 15883, uh, the AO value needs to be over 60 for a bedpan washer. How do we achieve that? Well, we adjust the temperature and we adjust the time time parameters. So um, as you can see, if you set the temperature in the, in the disinfection phase at 90 degrees, your rinse will need to be for one minute. And so you can see if it's um, uh, at 80 degrees, your rinse phase will need to be longer to achieve the same lethality to get to the same level of high level disinfection. The ISO standard 15883 is one of my favorite standards personally. For some unknown reason, I really enjoy the standard. My first few days on the job when I joined SAFMED, I, I spent the entire week studying this standard. I was quite fascinated to understand that what we assume to be just a device or just a washer or just a, some people sadly refer to them dishwashers, is not just a dishwasher. The, the attention to detail, the parameters that are required in the manufacturer of these devices, I find quite fascinating. ISO 15883 standard has got five main parts. There are some additional parts that are being worked on at the moment. But part one is uh, the general requirements. It refers to the terms, it refers to the definitions, and a variety of test methods. Part two is for specifically um, surgical instrumentation. Part three refers to a device used to clean uh, human waste. So that would be a bedpan washer or urinal washer. And part four is the washer disinfector used for endoscopes. So we refer to them as automated endoscopic reprocessors. Part five of the standard goes into the detail around the test soils because we need to test them to make sure that they are doing the job that it is they are intended to do. There are a variety of test soils that use, are used. We can't inoculate um, instruments with proper contaminants all the time and in the laboratory setting um, um, re reproduce this because we don't want to expose people unnecessary. So, there are a variety of test soils. There's the Edinburgh test soils, there's some European different um, uh, uh, recipes for these soils that can be created in a laboratory um, and there are some that are commercially available that you can purchase uh, commercially ready-made. The test soils are a combination of, um, of often egg-based stuff, dye, sometimes they use sheep's blood, it's depending on the circumstances um, and the recipe of the test soil. ISO 15883, ISO being international standard, uh, South Africa, um, 
has adopted ISO 15883, as you can see over there. You can buy these standards um, electronically or the printed version, if you like, off the SAB's website. As the parts that are currently adopted are uh, part one, uh, part two for automated washer disinfectors. There you can see it, requirements and tests for washer disinfectors employing thermal disinfection for surgical instruments, anesthetic equipment, bowls, dishes, receivers, utensils, and glassware. And then there's part four, which we've just adopted now, the latest version in 2020. I'm going to focus on three aspects around ISO 15883 part one. The first part is it governs the design of the device. It governs the door locking mechanism. It, discovered, it covers the mechanicals, the electricals, the safety issues, the controls that must be in place in order for an automated washer disinfector to be validated and verified. We don't want to pop off to macro and buy an undercounter little washer and pop it into our CCSDs and expect that it'll do a job. It will never do the job. You can only use a washer that is, or you certainly should only use a washer in your, um, in your CCSDs that is compliant with ISO 15883. ISO 15883 will specify the performance criteria, how clean we expect a device to be, how well it should rinse. In fact, in one of the type tests in the, in the standard, they measure the amount of detergent in the last phase of the rinse. They take the rinse water, they grab it from the trap, and they actually measure the amount of chemistry left in there to make sure that everything is being rinsed off the instruments properly. Those are tests you can't repeat in your own setting, and therefore it's very important you follow what the manufacturer tells you. It defines the disinfection, it defines the drying, uh, the filters that are required. It's very, very specific. And then a concept I'd like to introduce, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, Within the validation process of ISO 15883, there are three important aspects. They called the installation qualification, the operational qualification, and the performance qualification. The manufacturer has to perform a variety of tests that are standardized, that at the end of the day, once the device has been installed, that they can prove to you 100% based on all of those tests, that that device is doing the job that it is meant to be doing, that it's been manufactured accordingly and it's doing the job it's meant to be doing. The performance qualification, well, that's up to us, the end user. In the standard, because we want the machine to be effective, remember it's human lives are on the line here, the machine has to work properly. It's got two processes to it, or two arms to its processes, the one being the control mechanism and the other being the monitoring. The control, for example, will set the water temperature. The control says, okay, we want the water temperature to be at 93 degrees now in the disinfection phase. It controls that. The monitoring is a sensor inside the washer to make sure that measures the temperature, to make sure you actually get to that 93 degrees. So it's a dual system at all times, so that the one system controls it and the other system monitors to make sure that it does actually achieve the controlled preset parameters. If something goes wrong, there's generally a series of alarms. If the detergent didn't come into the chamber, it should alarm. If the detergent has run out in the bottle, it may alarm. It depends on the design of the machine. Some do, some don't. So let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail. Why would I prefer to wash my instruments decontaminate my instruments in an automated washer disinfector and not do it by hand. Consistency. The automated washer disinfector will take in the right amount of detergent, the right amount of water, 
every single time. It is 100% consistent. It will wash with the same amount of water force that is required every single time. When I'm doing it by hand, as I mentioned last week, if I'm a bit tired, I might be rushing through the process. If I've got all day and I'm in a good mood, I'll go, ee da dee da spend my time cleaning the device. I am not consistent, I am not as predictable, I am not scientific. However, all of that consistency will only be applicable if you load the washer correctly. So there are certain human elements that are very important behind this. As I said, the washer disinfector has got a verification system. It monitors, so it self-monitors that all of the process controls are working properly. And in addition, there are things that we as the end user can use, devices that we can use to test that it actually did what it was meant to do. Another added benefit, of course, is that we can select a cycle for the job at hand. If I've got grossly contaminated instruments, so they're really bloody and it's a bit dry, I'm going to choose the longest uh, uh, cycle necessary that perhaps has got two rinse phrases um, before getting to the main wash phase. I choose the cycle that suits the job at hand. The other thing, of course, is I can wash my containers properly because I can get the right rack for them and make sure that they clean properly. And throughput versus manual. If you were to take the instruments out of a set and wash each one individually, thoroughly, it would take you much longer to wash the 12 or 15 sets that are in the washer than, uh, than it would for the washer to process them because if the washer is loaded correctly, if you've got the right racks in it and you've prepared the instruments correctly, you will actually wash quicker through a washer than you will manually. I know we cheat and we think in our minds that it's quicker to wash it by hand. Honestly, it isn't. And of course, then there's the value add of disinfection and drying. At the end of the cycle, your instrument should be coming out of the washer disinfector, dried, assuming you haven't jockeyed the cycle parameters, because that's the other naughty thing that we tend to do is when the install installation happens, we say to the, to the installer, the company that comes to install, no, 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 it can't take 55 seconds, 55 minutes, or it can't take 35, whatever it is. We say, I don't know, mm -mm, it must come out much faster. I don't have enough sets for that. And then we say, just jockey there. And then at the end of the day, we adjust the parameters, which is really not a good thing. The whole idea is to make these instruments safe for us to handle while we are busy preparing the sets. We want to disinfect them so that they are safe for us, so that we don't end up having a problem. And this disinfection cycle and process will kill COVID-19. There are different types of washer disinfectors. You have a single chamber washer disinfectors and you have multi-chamber washer disinfectors. So a single chamber washer disinfector, as you can see, has one rack, one contained closed unit. You'll place the rack, you'll close the door, and the whole process happens in one chamber. The pre-rinse, the rinse, the wash, the disinfect, the drying, all happens in one process. Hopefully you've got a pass-through drawer system, which is really nice if your design allows for it, which means you put your stuff in on the dirty side. Uh, once the cycle is finished, you open the door on the clean side. You remove your clean items. A multi-chamber washer has a series of chambers and you'll, you'll slot your, your first rack into the machine. It'll start with the washing process. Uh, then, uh, depending on how the machine is set up, for example, perhaps in chamber number two is the disinfection process. The rack will then move to chamber number two. Whilst that rack is in chamber number two, a new rack can come into the, into the beginning or the first chamber and so on and so forth, which means a multi-chamber washer gives you a huge amount of throughput. So if you've got a number of sets to get through, multi-chamber washers can be very effective for that process. The disadvantage of a multi-chamber washer is they are a little bit more expensive, of course. 
and they've got a huge footprint, so they take up a lot of space. And if they go down, you might be a bit buggered because you may only have one. So there are pros and cons. Some hospitals, therefore, choose to install multi-chamber washers as well as one single-chamber washer for, uh, for consistency and continuity of business. All automated washer disinfectors will come with the selection of racks and inserts, which is why it's very important that if you have the opportunity, if you're still building a unit or you're involved in a changeover and a design, that you select the right type of racks up front. You need to understand what it is you're going to wash. You need to understand your volumes that are coming through because you don't want a backlog in your CSSD. As you can see over there, there are uh, racks that can be used for minimally invasive surgical instruments. There are racks that can be used for um, uh, uh, anesthetic uh, tubing, if that's what you need to clean. Some racks are designed uh, to have different uh, levels. So you might have a, a five rack uh, five level or five shelf rack and you can get 10 sets in there which is really awesome because you can get a lot of sets in except sometimes what happens is we don't think it through is some of the instrument that we have some of our retractors and even a um, ovars for example stands quite tall so if you buy a five level rack you may not be able to fit all of the types of devices in there that you think need to go in there. So it's important to have racks interchangeable. So you've got a five level rack and you've got a three level rack because then you can change them depending on what it is you're washing. Some of your orthopedic loan sets and trays will not fit in a five level rack. Some racks are adjustable as in you can take one shelf out and now you've got four, rack, four shelves instead of five. So depending on your need, depending on your circumstances will depend on the type of rack that you need to select. If you only have one size fits all rack, you can go back to your manufacturer and ask them what other alternative racks are available. Before you put anything into the automated washer disinfector, you need to uh, prepare everything. It's very important and sometimes people for some reason or another seem to forget this. You will begin by um, removing all the bits of debris in the tray that may have ended up there. If you can get rid of the bit of bone, the tooth, the suture material, uh, occasionally the blade, um, and all sorts of odds and sods that we've seen in there. If you've got uh, tips, rubber tips or tip protectors on, you need to throw them, uh, remove them. You can't expect the instrument to come clean with the tip, the tip protector still in place. And of course, if you've got any tray liner or if you've got any chemical indicators that are left in there, please they need to be removed before you place the tray in the washer disinfector. The picture on the top right hand corner is that of a spray arm. So the water, like your Dish a washer, dish a washer at home will come through the hole on the spray arm. If the spray arm gets clogged, if something gets stuck in there, it will not work properly. The water will not come out at that point, which means certain dishes, certain dishes, certain items, certain instruments will not be cleaned. If you look at the little image over there, that is actually a chemical indicator that has somehow or another slipped through the sieve in the bottom end of the, of the base of the chamber and has ended up in the actual spray arm and has clogged the nozzle. The items in the bottom of the, of the slide, those I took out of a spray arm one day, all of them, I don't know how we managed to get them in there, it was quite scary. Loading and unloading. Like most things, if you don't like a computer, <laughs> the computer can't do everything for you. There is some user interface. There's something about what you need to do and how you manage it. So if you don't load the washer correctly, if you don't manage the washer correctly, of course, you will not end up with a good result. It makes good sense that you need to open any hinge joint instruments really, really wide. It's impossible for the water detergent mix to get into the grooves and the crevices if you haven't exposed them, if you haven't opened them. On the left hand side, you will see a variety of different trays. If you're using a tray that is not meshed, if you're using a solid base tray, which you shouldn't be using to begin with, you've got some really old 
weird, odd instrument trays that we bought from I don't know where that were just punched with those little holes in them and they aren't meshed, you will not get an effective clean. Remember the water from the spray arm comes from above and the water from the spray arm comes from below. And if there is a whole lot of metal in the way, you really are not going to get an effective clean. So very important that you use the correct tray. If you only have these really solid, not ideal types of trays, you will need to take the instruments out of that and put them into another tray, which is a terrible waste of time, not very efficient. So it makes good sense that if you're using automated washer disinfectors that you have a selection of trays that are suitable for the job. Three concepts to talk about here hollow items, heavy items, and shadowing. Hollow items, so uh, bowls and basins, can either be put in a, in a rack or an insert designed to hold them in the correct position, like containers, for example, as well. There is racks designed to hold the containers. Or if you're doing kidney bowls and you're doing it with another cycle and you don't want to change the rack, you need to make sure that those hollow items are turned upside down. Otherwise, at the end of the cycle, you're going to end up with a kidney dish with a hell of a lot of hot water that is of risk to you to begin with, and it's not dried. It defeats the objective of the whole washer. Very important to turn those upside down. For a good cleaning result, or good cleaning efficacy, place the heavier items towards the bottom of the washer because that way you get the drip of the water all the way through. It's a far more effective clean for heavier, bigger items to be right near the bottom of the, of the washer. Then the important concept of shadowing. So shadowing one item shadows over the other. If one item is shadowing over the other, the water is not going to get to it. So it is not going to get cleaned. I've often been called out for a variety of incidences and the things that have gone wrong are absolutely amazing. And a lot of the time, it's because we're using it incorrectly. If you look at the picture on the left, if the tray is like that, you cannot expect the instrument to be clean. Often people say to me, we don't understand. We take the instruments out and, we, and, and, and they're all stuck together and they, they, they just, you know, really? You may want to add a lubrication in your process, but certainly if you put your instruments in a tray like this, they're not going to come clean. It's impossible. All instruments with hinges need to be open, they need to be spread. Unloading. Hopefully you've used some form of cleaning indicator that checks the cleaning efficacy. When it comes to unloading the washer disinfector, the first thing you want to do is find the cleaning indicator to check that it has come clean. We've had incidences where the um, cleaning indicator did not come clean and when we came to understand and inspect, we'll look at the chemistries just now, it was a chemistry, chemistry issue. We had the wrong chemical or we, um, we've um, we ran out of chemical, it was really quite sad, or somebody put water in the detergent bottle, or you put the lance in the wrong bottle, they put the detergent lance in the rinse aid lance, um, and the cleaning um, indicator will pick that up if we've made a human error. One thing that we also found once is somebody, for some reason, had disconnected the racks and had put the spray arm in the wrong way around. And it was the very top spray arm where the water only comes from the, uh, from the top. And they'd put it in the wrong way around. So the spray arm was actually spraying the roof of the chamber and not the top row of the instruments. Of course, so I'm now unloading. The first thing I'm looking for is my cleaning indicator to make sure that everything has worked correctly. Then I need to visually inspect the instruments. This, of course, at that point is with my naked eye. Hopefully I can also get to inspect them under lighted magnification. And uh, at some point we'll learn a little bit more about it, advanced um, way, ways and means of, of visually inspecting instruments, which I learned lots about at the World Forum Fast Rule Sterile Supply Congress in Holland last year. So I'm visually inspecting to see that the items are clean. If they're not clean, they need to go back. They need to be reprocessed. And the reason they aren't clean may be a detergent-related issue. It could be how I loaded the washer. 
And at that point, now I also want to inspect the inside of the chamber of the washer. If there's a buildup of white stuff, something's happening with my water quality. If there's stuff in the sieve, it means I'm not looking after my machine. I'm not cleaning out the trays. I'm leaving all sorts of bits and pieces in there. That stuff in the sieve is a problem because with enough force, it might get through the sieve and end up um, down in your motor or somewhere horrid. Okay. The rack itself. The rack needs to be inserted in a specific fashion. Um, sometimes uh, we can get it the wrong way around. If you've taken the whole rack out, you put it back in, you put it in the wrong side round, uh, then the two manifolds don't join and water doesn't go into the correct areas where it needs to be. So it's very important that the rack is inserted correctly. Make very sure that when you're installing this or it's the first time you're using it or you've got new staff, that whoever it is from whatever company that installed this washer for you comes and trains you on those details. You don't just want to know about which button must I press. That's just one of your things. You need to know the details that you can preempt issues that you can solve your own problems as well. So make sure that the rack is inserted correctly so that the water, uh, the manifolds join and that the water comes in where it needs to come in. Generally speaking, in most uh, machines, doesn't matter what design or who made it, there's a, f a sieve at the bottom. That sieve needs to be emptied, it needs to be cleaned, it needs to be managed, it needs to be maintained. Somewhere relating to your system, is a series of chemicals. There is a lance that goes into the bottle, the chemistry, and depending again on the design and um, the whole sinus circle setup of your machine, uh, you may have an alkaline detergent with a neutralizer. Or you may have a detergent that doesn't require a neutralizer. You may have a de detergent, a rinse aid, and a neutralizer. You may just have a detergent with no rinse aid. Again, it depends on your circumstances. You may have chosen to um, add a lubricant uh, a wash to your, to your final rinse. Depending on your setup will depend on your scenario. If you put the lance in the wrong bottle, so you put the detergent lance in the, um, in the rinse aid bottle or in the, and, and at the end of the day, you end up with rinse aid when you're supposed to be getting detergent, you won't get a proper clean. It's very important that you read the labels carefully. Sometimes the chemistries are of similar colors. And um, if you put the wrong one the wrong way around, it could really have a terrible consequence. We once found the detergent lance was in the detergent bottle, but what was in the bottle was no longer detergent. For some reason, somebody filled it up with water and the detergent disappeared. Not too sure what happened to it but that's very important. And that's why cleaning um, chemical indicators are very important because they'll pick up on those errors. Please, we have to look after the spray arms. That's an important part of the service and maintenance. And of course, uh, your maintenance engineers will come and look at that for you. Preferably, of course, you want to use the company who supplied you the device and not necessarily your hospital maintenance engineers unless they are suitably trained. Very important to make sure that the spray arms are not blocked and very important to make sure that the spray arms can rotate. Also, once you've loaded everything into the washer, to make sure that, there's no, that the spray arm doesn't catch on the, for example, the ovards. If you've got a tall standing ovards, it's possible that it catches on the spray arm. Right, validation and verification. Validation and verification, concepts that are intertwined but different. So validating something is a process, a standard set of procedures that you perform in a very scientific measure repeatedly to make sure that something works properly. So the device manufacturer, somebody who makes your automated washer disinfector, performs a variety of type tests. So that printout at the bottom left of the screen, that was when we, in, in the South African setting, we used a particular detergent in, in um, 
in the automated washer disinfectors that we sell. And the market had changed a lot. We were washing now our containers and a lot more softer metal-based devices in our automated washer disinfectors. So there was a need to change the types of detergents we use. But we couldn't just go ahead, go ahead and say, oh, no problem, let's use this one. It's softer on metals and ideal for these scenarios. Let's just use that. No, you can't just do that. Um, a whole series of type tests had to be performed by the manufacturer which were all done in Denmark, um, and um, we measured the temperature, the incoming temperature, we used a variety of cleaning indicators, and only once that had been determined to be effective, we were allowed to use that different type of detergent. So that's all part of the manufacturer's responsibilities and type tests that they do. So that's in the IQ and the OQ, installation and operational. Then is verification. So validation, as we said, a, a set standard operating procedure processes that the manufacturer must do. Verification is the end user. That's us. That's us in the CSSD. We have to now confirm that what was supposed to happen did happen. And for that, we also use test soils or cleaning indicators. The test soils and cleaning indicators that we use are ones and we must use, that are manufactured in accordance with the ISO 15883 or the SANS 15883, or we haven't adopted Part 5 yet in South Africa, ISO 15883 Part 5. There are soils that you can use, paint on soils, uh, that are commercially available, or you can use cleaning uh, indicators, and there are numerous ones available on the market, no, quite a few suppliers these days. How well are we cleaning our... Um, our instruments uh, in the South African setting, what have we seen around automated washer disinfectors? So this is again uh, information from our research. But remember this was 2015 already, so it's a couple of years ago. Uh, what did I find at the time? How many people were cleaning manually? How many people were cleaning using their automated washer disinfector? It was about 50-50 at the time. Um, that may have changed a bit, I hope. I hope we're using more automated washing than we were back then. Um, also, of course, often we have automated washer disinfectors, but we decide we want to um, hurry up the process, perhaps because we don't have enough sets or what a reason we come up with, which is really not ideal. We know in the real world it is difficult, but we really must look at this, that we go through an automated washing process and we don't skip that. I've seen... Um, scrub sisters often will wash stuff in scrub rooms and then just send it down to CCD to be autoclaved and packed. Sometimes not necessary to do that. Sometimes not necessary to flash. We need to think about that clearly. Correct trays. Did we use the correct trays? Mm, most of the time. And then of course shadowing. So did we load the items in a way that they, uh, they were shadowed. Yes, we did. And how many times did we overload the, uh, the automated washer? Well, pretty much often. So if you have all of those things happening, then that can obviously affect your, um, the consequences of your cleaning efficacy. So again, in, in the research, I did a series of pattern matching. So what did I find over here? Those items um, that were washed in the automated washer disinfector that were not positive for protein, 81% of them were not positive for protein, and that's quite reassuring. That is nice to know. But 19% of them were still positive for residual protein, even though they'd been through an automated washer disinfector. Why was that? Perhaps that had to do with the overloading. Perhaps that had to do with the incorrect use of the trays or the wrong type of trays that will obviously affect the cleaning efficacy. Right, so one last factor I want to challenge you about today, and this is this paper published in the ARN, uh, I think that was this year, yes it was. Decreasing our reprocessing costs by reducing the number of instruments in our sets. As a scrub sister, I agree with you, we need to be able to have what it is we need on the table when we need it. That's a given. But sometimes we end up with too many items in our trays that may not necessarily need to be there. So this is about lean management. This is about lean processing. Thank you, Nanette, for that terminology, of course. Um, we don't need to waste. And when we waste, we're wasting time. We're wasting electricity. We're wasting resources. We're wasting money. 
And I don't know that we really and truly need to be having that many instruments in all of our sets. Maybe you can create um, a tray of extras for GIs or something or another and take a few of the instruments off the laparotomy set and have some standing on standby, close at hand, near to your theatre, in the ante room, close by, so that um, we don't have to continuously reprocess them. Honestly, when you get to the CSSD, generally speaking, we've used maybe a third of the instruments in the tray sometimes, depending on the tray. Uh, this is my challenge to you today. Do we need that many instruments in our trays? Right, what have we covered in today's session? Why do I want to use an automated washer disinfector? I think we've covered that really clearly. You get a disinfection rinse, you get consistency, you get reliability, you get re reproducibility, and you get the ability to validate and verify that your instruments are and have been cleaned. It makes them so much safer to handle at the end of the day for the individual who's now about to pack them. All automated washer disinfectors, please make sure you're purchasing one that's, that's manufactured according to the standard. Make sure that you look after them properly, that you load them correctly, that you unload them correctly, that you maintain them, that you manage them correctly, and at the end of the day, that you validate and verify that your cleaning was effective. <laughs>